Our friend Dolphus Ramser was born and raised in Concord, North Carolina, a town so rich with history that it provided the inspiration for his independent record label and management company. So great was the city's influence on Ramser that he continues to live and work in Concord today with a full-time staff located in both North Carolina and California. He and his team always put their clients' music first, work as hard as they can, and have fun along the way. Visit Ramser.com to learn more. Welcome to The Road to Now, where we look to the past and everywhere in between to understand the present. I'm Bob Crawford, and joining me as always is Dr. Ben Sawyer. Yep, as always. I'm always here, and I always will be, Bob. And today, speaking of something seems to have always been here and maybe won't be, we're talking about the history of oil. That was a great segue. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So our guest today is Paul Roberts. He wrote a book in 2004 called The End of Oil, which I hadn't actually looked at until we got ready for this interview, but had always heard about. This was a big book when it came out. And Paul is a journalist. He's written for Harper's, and he's been on pretty much everything TV-wise and news-wise. We learn tons about oil, and oil is kind of the one that's conventional. Uh, We think about that maybe in coal as kind of the two standbys. Just the way that oil affects the world and has affected the world is tremendous. You know, I'm a big believer in renewable energy. I'm a big supporter of it, but we just can't forget the human cost of completely walking away from the oil industry and the coal industry and all the jobs and all the secondary jobs that that come from those industries. We can't walk away from the human currency that is a, that is affected by this transition we're making. There are no easy answers, and we, we do need to, to take care of the environment and protect it and preserve it. It's not all just black and white. It's either good or bad. No, it's, it's complicated, and, and people should be listened to and heard and treated with compassion. Paul Roberts, welcome to The Road to Now. That's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. We're doing a series on the history of energy production, and you are our expert on oil. Because you wrote this great book, came out in 2004, The End of Oil, which got so much praise. And I love the idea that we're talking to you now with some time from there to kind of reflect. And to start off, I was wondering if you could just take us back to, through the history of petroleum. How does it become How does it become a major source of power? And how does it maintain that, uh, that, that position in our energy economy despite clear fluctuations that might be red flags? Well, it's a, it's a good question. It's always good to um, remind ourselves of the how we got to, you know how we got to the present moment when we're talking about something as complicated as it, and as important as energy and oil in particular. So, you know what we think of as the modern oil industry begins in the middle of the 19th century. Two places it begins both in uh, Azerbaijan, you know Baku uh, on the Caspian, and also about a decade later in Pennsylvania. And at the time, oil was sought chiefly as a source of lamp fuel. We killed off so many of the sperm whales that provided most of the lamp oil at that time, you know, for illumination, essentially, that we needed a, another a substitute and oil kerosene, which is one of the fractions of oil, worked really well. So the initial push into the oil business was strictly for illumination. And interestingly, the only part of the crude oil that came out of the ground that refiners were interested in was the kerosene or lamp fuel, and they threw everything else away, including gasoline. They just poured it right into the, you know, on the ground, into rivers, whatever. So it was not only a really nasty business, but it was sort of a business with a completely different focus than we have today. It becomes, you know, motor fuel, gasoline and diesel become the primary sort of drivers for the oil business at at the end of the 19th century with the rise of the automobile, you know, with militaries like like Britain sort of shifting its navy from coal to oil. So there's this big push right at the turn of the 20th century as companies and countries alike recognize the massive benefits of and advantages of, of sort of a, an oil-fired industry or an oil-fired military. It's just much more efficient than coal. That, of course, then pushes more exploration and better technologies to explore, so come up with, with seismic technology that lets us look underground. We come up with new methods for drilling, deeper, more accurate, and then we come up with ways to refine oil. 
good barrel of oil will give you around maybe 25 gallons of gasoline and diesel. And so countries that produce that high quality crude, it's called a light sweet crude because it's lighter and gasoline and diesel are lighter. That oil is highly prized. In the United States, that's West Texas Intermediate. And then there's various countries around the world that have similar oil. So World War One's a big turning point because the British Navy is now using oil. World War Two is a big turning point because the United States uh, essentially turns into the oil producer for the world. We, we pump a lot out of the ground. We develop a massive refining complex, and we're supplying aviation fuel and tank fuel, not only for our own armies, but for our allies as well. Because up until World War II, cars were designed with fuel efficiency in mind because uh, gasoline was so expensive. But after the war, we've got all this surplus capacity. So now gasoline is, is relatively cheap. And it's not coincidence that uh, Detroit begins manufacturing high-performance cars. And, and so you have this like demand that's beginning to build up. And as demand grows, then production grows. And you know you have the oil companies, there's about seven at the time, who are now not only working in, in the United States, but they're working in the Middle East. That's become, you know, a huge a huge supply, South America. Then the the big hiccup is is OPEC forms, you know, so you got the Middle Eastern nations plus Venezuela and they form sort of a cartel and begin bargaining with both the oil companies and also with the importing countries like the United States and, and Europe and Japan. So despite all of its its negatives, oil maintained its dominance primarily because it was so efficient. And that's really where the sort of the struggle today is, you know, what what does the government need to do to drive these other these alternatives to promote them sufficiently so that they can become competitive. So Paul, why, why don't we just go in and, and now go back to the geopolitical ramifications of the oil industry? How did they foster ties with the Middle East? So initially, you had a l- tons of competitors back in the late 19th century, tons of oil companies, and they were generally very small, haphazard, poorly run. I mean, essentially, a refinery operation is a still. You're heating up the oil, evaporating it, and then condensing it into its various components. And so people were doing these things out in the woods, much like you'd make whiskey. And many of them were blowing themselves up because it was just total ragtag operation. It was really inefficient. It was expensive. And you had a few sort of far-sighted folk, you know, Rockefeller being one, you know, who would eventually form Standard Oil. As oil boomed, Rockefeller realized that this was the field for him. In 1865, he went into a partnership with an experienced oil refiner, the Englishman Samuel Andrews. Refining oil made more sense to Rockefeller than drilling for it. Wells dried up, but every driller needed a refinery. So he rolls up the industry and at one point controls, you know, close to 90%. And this is a, just like this is in the early 19, or the early 1900s, and it's recognized that you know, for, and first, and he drives the cost of kerosene and then gasoline down, and so consumers are really happy with it. They they don't mind the fact that it's a monopoly, but as he gains that control, he begins raising prices. It's actually no longer Rockefeller; it's his successor, but the company Standard Oil is now. It is controlling prices and raising them. It is controlling state legislatures because it has so much money. It's basically it owns court, you know, judges. So it's got this massive amount of power and, and local governments, state governments can't or won't do anything to stop it. And so Teddy Roosevelt recognizes that the only power on the planet that is large enough to stand up to uh, an oil company is the federal government. And so they begin a legal proceeding against Standard Oil and eventually break it up into dozens of companies. But there were there were four or five big ones, and they many of them went on to become oil companies that we recognize, two of the most prominent would be Exxon and Mobil. And because they had been cut off from, in many cases, from their oil fields, because the company had been split up, they had to go search for new oil fields. And it was about that time that prospectors were making discoveries in Venezuela and Mexico. And so there was a big push to to quickly exploit those fields, come up with, uh, you know, arrange deals with the governments, and then start producing the oil. Companies are realizing early on that this is going to be a very tricky business. It's going to require almost as much diplomatic finesse as if they were a country. In fact, Exxon was known as kind of the UN of oil companies because it it, it recognized the diplomatic nature of the business it was in. So as the Middle East then sort of comes online and they find these massive fields in, in Iraq and Iran and eventually Saudi Arabia, the oil companies would typically rush in and say, 
look, you guys don't have the technology or the capital to develop any of these oil fields, but we can make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. And so we'll cut you a percentage. We'll, we'll sell the oil and we'll cut you a percentage. And it's a great deal. You don't have to do anything. And that worked for, you know, fine for a long time. And then the actual exporters, you know, the Saudis and the, um, the Iranians or the Persians uh, and so on, Venezuelans all recognized that they were getting, they could get, be getting a lot more. It was their oil. And so there was this big push to nationalize or threats to nationalize. The oil companies pushed back and sort of fought a rear guard action for, you know, a couple of decades, but eventually they just, they didn't have any power and they lost you know, most or all of their ownership status and became sort of contractors. So they were forced to go look in places like Russia or fracking. They began to have to look at oil that had been in formations that were too hard to get at with just regular drills. So they were really forced to innovate. In the meantime, you had these oil kingdoms going through all this tumult themselves. They were becoming incredibly rich, but it was also incredibly destabilizing. Basically, we're being overwhelmed by this flood of wealth. It's just so corrupting. And you can see that in the African nations. Oil is a blessing and it's also a curse. Countries that have managed to sort of deal with it successfully are typically those that had sort of substantial economies beforehand. Thinking about the government intervention as far as American corporations and foreign oil, I think of Mossadegh from Iran, and he was overthrown by the CIA and MI6. Former Premier Mossadegh's ruined house is a mute testimony to three days of bloody rioting culminating in a military coup from which the one-time dictator of Iran fled for his life. His car, as well as his home, is a shambles. In the quick shift of power, Mossadegh was finally apprehended and awaits trial for treason. The Shah, who had fled to Rome, comes home, backed by General Zahedi, military strongman, who engineered his return to power. The general will now have a strong voice in the newly formed government, whose cabinet is seen here with Shah Pahlavi. Iranian oil may again flow westward. Because he wanted to nationalize the oil industry in Iran? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's certainly one of the reasons. Um, I, I suspect that it wasn't, you know... The, there was a fear that it would have been a, you know, it wouldn't just be the oil industry and it would send signals to other oil producers that they also could nationalize. It was, you know, it was essentially part of a rear guard action by Western powers to sort of delay the inevitable. As always, there's more going on than just concerns about oil being nationalized. I think there was fear that this region that was so fraught with instability uh, and so increasingly strategic and important was going to, you know, try to become more sovereign. You know, you had the, the sort of the pan-Arab movement, Nasser uh, in Egypt kind of going on at that time. So it's a very complicated picture. And I guess what's always, I always, you know, want to remind people that oil is a big factor here. It's always been the, it's the prize, as Daniel Yuring calls it, absolutely. But it's never the sole driver. And people who insist that Iraq war was all about oil. I mean, that would be a really weird world to live in if it was just oil, you know, and, and that we were ignoring all the other strategic sort of issues over there. Again, not to downplay the role that oil plays, but I think uh, a lot of times, you know, advocates who are pushing for a non-oil world and, and want to move us away from oil, demonize oil even beyond what it actually deserves and 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 i think the danger there is that if if they're shown to be incorrect then that kind of that weakens their position so sort of the same thing about climate you have to be careful about saying that every storm or every heat wave is caused by climate because then if you have a cool year people can say oh there you go see and i think that the same holds for oil you have to recognize that you know the decision say to go to war in iraq is very complicated and has a whole history, you know, behind it has a lot of players and each of those players has his, his or her own agenda. So as always, it's, you know, complicated and oil is important, but it's not the only important thing. But is it is it safe to kind of assume that a lot of the trouble we have with Islamic terrorism today is kind of was fueled by the United States government and oil corporations treatment of that part of the world throughout the 20th century because uh, of the overthrow of the Iranian leader who was well loved. Ultimately, 20 some years later, you know, you have the uprising in Iran where the Americans are taken hostage. It's all kind of baked in the cake, right? Of our relationship with the Middle East. I think that's, I think it's fair. I think, but oil again, 
use that metaphor as one of the ingredients. And, you know, there are other things going on. I mean, you know, there's the fact that you have a region that is, you know, massively, it, it's massively broiled by income inequality. And again, that's driven by oil, but it's, but it's not simply oil. It's the fact that they don't have much of a government structure. Their political system is a lot of data and it can't allocate resources in anything close to an equitable way. So you've got massive income inequality of populations booming. You have, you know, whatever oil's role was in, say, the middle of the last century, in terms of setting in, in, in motion the various dynamics that would make it a really tough part of the world. Right now, what we have is a situation where the, the oil legacy is there, but now you have on top of that, you know, this massive power vacuum, you know, left by not just the war, but the collapse of some of these regimes in the Arab Spring. And you have these religious extremism, which it was sort of there from the start. I mean, that's been there for, uh, that's been problematic in Saudi Arabia, for example, for more than two centuries. It was just a bargain between the, the ruling family and the Wahhabi sort of extremists to sort of jointly govern. That's the only thing that kept that from bubbling up into a civil war. And now it's out, it's basically happening. So I think that right now we've got a mess that's even more, con- it's been certainly driven in part by oil's role, but now it's so much more complicated than just, you know, oil. And that makes it all the more difficult to solve. And it makes it all the more difficult to to live in an oil-dominated economy because, again, you've got this very volatile region still supplying a lot of our primary fuel and we're even less sort of capable of managing it and keeping it stable. I think it's really interesting that we have this relationship with the Middle East and for at least the first couple of decades of oil production, it was fairly one-sided with the Western countries getting the advantage. But as you mentioned earlier, uh, the formation of OPEC pushes a really, really, really strong hand of these smaller producers into the oil market. And in 1974, we see this incredible oil embargo, which shuts down production. It's, it's amazing because the pictures, you know, they, you could only get gas certain days based on the, your tag number. And it really shuttered the American automotive industry. Well, in February, if you look up this hill, we had lines that used to start 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, this station didn't open until 7. And as far as the eye could see, there was a never-ending line of automobiles. It got so bad during the month of February that I honestly broke down twice and cried. Now, this sounds stupid, I know. And they would just stand on the islands for three, four, five hours until you ran out of gasoline. And, of course, we had that occurring as early as 9 o'clock on many mornings. The line was at the top of this hill, and the wait was an hour, hour and a half. A lot of people couldn't make it to work because it was lined up so bad to people decide not even to ride. You know, you got people threatening to hit you in the head with gas cans, especially one old lady threatened to hit me in the head with a gas can. She, she was so mad. She really did. And what's amazing is that it seems like there's an awareness in the 70s, like this could go bad. But then a couple years later, it's like it never happened. And we go back every time it seems like there's, there's a, a peak. We were aware for a, a year or two that the finite nature of petroleum and then suddenly we're back to doing what we're doing and we get hit with it again. Why do you think it is that, that our relationship to oil is so short-sighted? Well, I think it's because the people in this, at the middle of that equation, you know, the humans on the planet are really short-sighted. You know, we, we, I mean, we just respond. We, we're not designed to think long-term. We just aren't. And uh, we have institutions that we sort of built up over time that help us overcome that short-sightedness, you know, whether we're talking about churches or, you know, political systems corporations even, you know, those are all capable of longer term thinking and and planning. But human beings, we respond to sort of near term signals and price being a very important one. And as you point out, you know, we sort of saw Jesus in the early 70s and the price of gasoline forced us to change. And it was we were already sort of teetering on on the edge of, of our cars are too big. The recession combined with the price spike in gasoline really forced this massive reassessment and rethinking. And so you did get these smaller cars, and many of them were just terrible. You know, the, the Mustang II, the Gremlin, the Pacer, you know, K-Car. I mean, they were really hideous. And the thing was, they weren't just hideous, but they were 
completely outclassed by the German and Japanese economy cars, which had actually been sort of, you know, nibbling mar- American market share since the 60s. Um, but they, re- you know, they obviously took over and ate our lunch. And, you know, it, was, it, was, it didn't help that Detroit was also, you know, the big three were also really poorly managed at that point because they'd gotten so complacent. They and their unions had both. So there's this sort of perfect storm that, that forces Americans to start driving smaller cars, drive less frequently, and then the incentive goes away. These really high prices in the 70s, you know, if you're an oil company, you're thinking, jeez, if I can make this much a barrel, I better go find more barrels. And so they, they upped their game, looked for more oil. You know, fields that had been too expensive to operate when oil was cheap now became viable. So, you know, about the time the late 80s roll around, it, and it takes, you know, seven to 10 years to develop an oil field. So it's this massive lag, and that lag is really, really trips us up. You know, so we invest all this money, and then let's say a decade later, all that oil hits the market. And it all hit it in the 90s, which force oil companies basically up against the wall. A lot of them were either going to fail or sell themselves to their larger competitors. So, you know, Exxon buys mobile. BP buys Amoco, Chevron buys Texaco. You have this consolidation sort of, so it's, it's almost like the big oil giants the government had worked so hard to break up a century before we're now reassembling right before our eyes. But from the consumer standpoint, as the oil companies are barely surviving, consumers are loving it and Detroit is loving it because it's got a new lease on life. It doesn't have to sell small cars. It can sell these big you know, SUVs and, and pickup trucks. And and the the progress that we had made in terms of fuel efficiency and would just disappeared. It just it just turned around. Yeah, this is this is what's amazing is that when we spoke with the other folks about coal and nuclear energy, so much of that the, our policy and and you know the production from those sources. It seems like politics has as much to do with the production of those forces as technology does. And now you're talking about oil. What's really interesting is when you we talk about it, your focus seems to be outside of politics, that, that this is something where you do see the market being the primary force. I think that, you know, to be fair, it's a dance between that because these oil companies are politically powerful, but they're not as politically powerful as a lot of their opponents think. I mean, it's in government's interest to have a stable energy supply. It's absolutely essential. You can't have that at risk because that puts everything else at risk. You know, it, it puts the entire economy at risk. The government recognized that coming up with an alternative is is challenging and you can't rely on it. And so in the meantime, you're going to need an oil supply. I mean, that that is really, even if you're a green to the bone environmentalist, if you're realistic, you have to recognize that, you know, these technologies that are showing promise in electric cars, hybrids, uh, various alternative fuels, public transit, whatever, those things will take, in a best case scenario, decades to roll out in sufficient you know, at sufficient scale to make a dent in our oil consumption. You know, we're talking decades, right? And so in the meantime, you need oil to run the economy, to sort of fuel the transition away from oil, which means that you're going to have to do things like frack, and you're going to have to do things like deal with Russia and Iran. Maybe we leave the worst oil in the ground, you know, some of the stuff that's like the, the most damaging to climate. Maybe we try to isolate countries like Iran that are using their oil wealth to do some really questionable things with their neighbors. But you, you can't just walk away from oil that quickly. And, and it's not just a matter of, you know, let's make electric cars. I mean, you know, you've got to think about it. It's like the average consumer, I mean, we, we, we change our cars, you know, every 12 to 15 years. That's how long we kind of swap the, it takes to swap the fleet out. It, it's possible if, if we decided that we have to go electric in 10 years yeah, we could build enough factories to crank out enough electric cars so that everyone on the planet could have one. But then at the end of 10 years, you'd have all these factories and you wouldn't have any need for them. And there's no company on the planet that's going to make that kind of investment. So you're sort of left with this time scale that you can push, you can you can accelerate. There's all sorts of ways you can make it as efficient as possible. But there's a minimum. Let's say we had a car that ran on air, okay, and that it was ready to sell and you start producing and sell, and that's all that we could produce, and consumers liked it, and it was affordable. So we had that. It would take us, like I said, you know, 15 years to, to swap the fleet out, and that's an absurdly best-case scenario. And during that period, you're going to have a lot of oil sort of to get us to there. So, again, it's, it's kind of going back to the you have to be realistic. That said, you can't use that realism as an excuse not to take action. So, Paul, how is the oil industry preparing for the self-driving car movement that's about to hit us i mean first of all you have companies if you look at exxon 
that are sort of diversifying. You know, they want to be in alternative fuels. They want to be in batteries. So that there's that. There's that sort of. There's the recognition that there's going to be this long wind down that I've just been describing, where they'll, you know, someone's going to have to produce oil, and so it'll be the most, the, the least cost producer and the least cost refiners that survive in that future of narrowing demand. If that makes sense. So that they, you know, they're they're all seeing themselves in that. Um, I also think that they, you know, to the extent that they can slow down sort of what they would call radical, say, climate legislation, you know, they'll do that. But there's a cost that they pay, a political cost. And also, I mean, one of the reasons Exxon sort of did a semi-about face on climate was, two, well, two things. They got rid of a CEO who had been just obsessively opposed to dealing with climate change. I think this is, this is something that all the oil companies are running into. One is that, you know, they would certainly on the one hand like to delay any sort of legislation or regulation that forces them to... Um, spend more money uh, or, or not be able to sell as much oil. On the other hand, I think a lot of these companies recognize that there is great PR costs to be paid for appearing not to take any action on climate. So Exxon's CEO, Lee Raymond, he was you know, a brilliant CEO, probably one of the smartest people in the oil business. He was a chemical engineer by training, and he was just convinced that, that climate change was not real, even though his company had been doing a lot of research, it turns out, on it. But what was happening was that Exxon was being isolated politically. I was having trouble getting an audience in Washington. I was also having trouble recruiting new talent because people were less and less willing to go work for a company that was so hardcore on climate. It, it didn't help that Exxon was also ill-disposed toward same-sex marriage, a very conservative, hyper-conservative company. So there was this recognition that, you know, it's going to hurt you on a lot of levels to not sort of address climate. And Tillerson, I think, you know, he was one of the people urging Trump not to pull out of the Paris Accord, in part because I think a lot of the oil companies would like to be part of that process and not just watching on the sidelines, or they want the U.S. to be part of it. But in terms of, you know, the question about, so now you have, you know, Rex Tillerson as the uh, Secretary of State, and, you know, here he is, this former head of one of the most sort of foreign policy savvy oil companies on, in history, a uh, company with a large, long history of, you know, making messes in other countries, of being very hard edged when it came to dealing with anything, you know, everything from climate to, uh, say, cleaning up major oil spills like the Exxon Valdez. And then he's got this relationship with Putin and Russia because he, you know, Tillerson in particular was was really instrumental in moving the in moving Exxon into Russia and sort of negotiating a lot of the deals with the Russian government with Russian oil companies. And so the question is, you know, what does that, does that pretty much guarantee that the United States is going to be this pro oil policy? And I think the the jury is really it's still out there. It, I think it's almost moot what Tillerson wants sort of personally or as a former oil CEO because the rest of the State Department and the rest of the you know, the, the, the administration's foreign policy is so, I guess, hostage to the lack of a center. You mean Jared Kushner is the secretary of, of everything? Amazingly, the, the 14-year-old Jared Kushner is not able to set to rights all the problems that <laughs> that his predecessors haven't been able to deal with. And there may be a there is a possibility that by the time this interview airs, Rex Tillerson is no longer the secretary of state. If you believe the report in Politico a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, I've I've really wondered about that because you know Tillerson. I mean, Exxon promotes one of the things it's famous for is is for really cultivating its leadership, and these people are not shrinking violets. You know, they are used to being type A, aggressive, assertive, loudest, tallest person in the room kind of people, and uh, very competitive. I mean, the, the 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 competition for that position was just you know almost Game of Thrones like, and so. The, the thought of this guy sort of cooling his heels while, you know, his boss doesn't seem to even be interested in the intricacies of foreign policy. You know, the, initially we were concerned that, you know, that Tillerson would see everything through the lens of a former oil man and that, who knows, he might still be in daily contact with his, you know, his successor at, at Exxon and making sure that whatever he does, whatever the U.S. does in terms of, you know, in its relation with, say, Russia or oil-producing countries, 
does nothing to harm Exxon's position. I mean, who knows? I mean, that would be sort of the the, the cynics view. I have, I you know have never spoken to Tillerson about his his role in the State Department, but I think that they would be. I think the 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 worry with Tillerson is less that he's going to remake the State Department in the in the in the you know shape of Exxon than it is that his whatever common sense and good sense he brings to the job is going to be sort of overwhelmed by the you know the the, the disarray at the rest of the administration. So, Paul, you've written a, a couple of books. Uh, you wrote also The End of Food. Oil, this was your first big book. What what was it that inspired you to t- undertake this project? I had written a, a story for Harper's Magazine about the SUV and, you know, the, the sort of the revival of Detroit and, and, and the revival of the muscle car, but in the form of this, you know, sort of faux utility. And I originally sort of approached it as a, this pop culture story, but you, what, what you saw, one of the implications of this of the SUV phenomena was this massive increase in, in oil demand, which then sort of made me look at the, the sort of the rest of the industry. And so, um, talking with an editor who had who had this sort of a similar interest, it just seemed like you know let's let's ask the question: What happens if oil gets so scarce that we can't use it? And is there is anyone even like making plans? You couldn't really understand car culture and the and the sort of the economics of of, of pr- producing a car without sort of understanding the economics of the energy that went into it in that, you know, you start realizing, wow, as soon as you start looking at oil, then you, then you see this is the nexus for geopolitics. It's got this incredible history. Um, it's, it's a huge part of American culture that people are so accustomed to, even at, that they sort of forget until it, it, it kicks them in the backside with a price spike or with some, you know, war in a distant region. And then it goes away and, you know, we keep learning our lessons and then we keep forgetting them. And it just it struck me as, are we doomed to that sort of cyclical behavior uh, or are we going to break out somehow? You know, we always talk about energy independence. Uh, if we can get the United States to be energy independent, we don't have to deal in, in the Middle East and with these uh, bad actors around the world. How close are we in the United States to being energy independent? It really depends how you define that. I mean, first of all, you know, we are producing, I think we've become, again, the biggest producer in the world thanks to this fracking. So um, we're actually exporting some oil or, or we're seeking the, the authorization to be able to export oil, uh, which is, you know, brand new. But um, the truth is we're still importing a lot of oil. We are still far from energy independence. And, and the, the more important point is there's really no such thing as energy independence because if we produced every barrel except for one, but it's that last barrel that sets the price for all the other ones. You know, so if we're having to import a barrel of oil and we're having to pay a lot, the Saudis a lot for it, then every domestic producer is going to say, um, okay, well, we'll charge the same amount for that. So it's, it's the marginal barrel that always sets the price. So you, until you produce all your own oil, you're not energy independent. And then the the, the fact of the matter is that even if we did – you know, produce all that oil, we would be still sort of economically linked to countries that were not energy independent. So, you know, China and Europe, these are our biggest trading partners. I mean, you know, we, we do a huge amount of business with those countries and, and, and they depend on the Middle East for a lot of their oil. So they are sort of over a barrel. And if they are, we are. If, if their economy tanks because they can't get enough oil, then our economy tanks, you know, because we're driven by exports. So the idea of energy independence, I mean, it's certainly better to be producing most of our own, in part because it's, you know, we're, we're, hired, we're employing people here and we're sending less, you know, our balance of, our, our balance of trade is, is more positive. So that's always good. But in terms of sort of a strategic advantage, it's not nearly as important as, you know, politicians sometimes make it sound. When what would make more sense, rather than focusing on energy independence, which, you know, the emphasis there is production, you'd focus on energy efficiency. You don't make any money selling less barrels of oil. I seem to remember a certain president going on television and telling everyone they should cut their heaters down and wear sweaters, and uh, that didn't go too well for him. Not very popular. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I want to thank 
all of our listeners for joining us on this four-part series about energy. What we really hope you gained from listening to these episodes is a sense of how complicated each of these sources of energy are and the effects, both good and bad, that they've had on our nation economically and environmentally. And as a historian, Bob, you make a history podcast with me. This is what makes me a historian. I think you're one too, man. Well, for you to confer, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you you thinking high, highly of, of me and, and my acquired knowledge uh, uh, either way. <laughs> you got it, man. Thank you for joining us today on The Road to Now. Our program is produced by Bob Crawford, Ben Sawyer, and Ian Scotta, edited by Bob Crawford and Ian Scotta. Paul DeFiglia provides our music. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and rate us on iTunes. For more information about this or any other episode, please visit theroadtonow.com. For Dr. Ben Sawyer, this is Bob Crawford. Take care. Take care.